All right, I'm back. We're recording. This is what I promised, a little discussion of Checkmate 577, and we're going to do it plenary session video edition. So let's see, let's see how this goes. So I read this paper. I read it a couple weeks ago, and I've been meaning to do this, but something keeps interrupting me. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to wing it and say what I think about Checkmate 577, which is adjuvant nivolumab and resected esophageal or GE junction cancer. This is the New England Journal of Medicine paper, April 1st. Um, it has a laudatory editorial that says it is the standard of care. Uh, nothing like a New England Journal of Medicine editorial to tell me that it is, in fact, the standard of care. So what is Checkmate 577? So this is a study of esophagus cancer. It has squames. It has adenos um, and GE junction, um, where they are randomized basically uh, after completing the cross-trial protocol, um, carbopaclitaxel, radiotherapy, chemo radiotherapy. Um, they undergo surgical resection. Key point is they have to have pathologic. Um, they are. They have to have pathologic evidence of disease. They can't have had pathologic complete response. So that means you're excluding people who have path CR. You have to have some disease either in the tumor or the nodes. And of course, we generally think nodes are a worse prognostic sign if you have a pathologic disease in there after definitive chemo RT or sorry, after a new adjuvant chemo RT. Um, the other thing to note in this study is they're randomized then to nivolumab or to placebo, um, and they are followed to see how they do. Okay, so be it. Um, what do I think about Checkmate 577? I guess um, as I started to read, I thought to myself, well, this is a study that's adding more treatment uh, in the adjuvant space. Uh, it's a novel type of drug. Uh, to my knowledge, there has never been an immunotherapy, an esophagus or GE junction cancer used in the adjuvant space. It's never existed. There's never been such a study. Um, and so when you are debuting a brand new class of medication into the adjuvant space, the only suitable endpoint is, of course, overall survival. It has to be overall survival. But here's what they say, quote, Challenges in enrollment and evidence to support disease-free survival as a surrogate for overall survival among patients receiving adjuvant therapy led to a protocol amendment in which DFS became the single primary endpoint and OS changed to the first secondary endpoint to be tested hierarchically. Oh, well, 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 wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. First of all, this surrogate validation study that they cite does not include any immunotherapy. So whatever relationship it identifies between DFS and subsequent OS in this cancer type cannot be extrapolated to drugs that fundamentally offer different mechanisms of action. Um, we all, many of us believe that um, cytotoxic therapy in the right circumstances is capable of a cure. There is some curative fraction, whether it's testicle cancer where it's sky high or even breast cancer where you cure a few more women. Um, we also think that cytotoxic therapy, when it's used in adjuvant spaces such as breast or lung cancer, that although it's able to generate a fractional increase in cure um, in the adjuvant space, that same drug given in the metastatic space is going to do nothing but uh, delay death. It won't avert death. It doesn't cure a fraction of people in the metastatic space. So there's certain properties of cytotoxic drugs that go into any validation study. One, the hypothesis is that it can increase curative fraction if given to microscopic disease. Two, that if that same drug were given um, in the macroscopic setting, in the visible metastatic setting, uh, there is no curative fraction. That's a property of cytotoxic drugs in, in at least um, most solid tumors I'm familiar with. Um, with a few exceptions, of course, testicle where it can cure advanced disease and Hodgkin's where it can cure. If you consider Hodgkin's or hemolytic. Okay, well, we're on a tangent. Back to this case. Here, you're trying to use a relationship derived from certain principles of cytotoxic drugs and apply it to immunotherapy, which might be fundamentally different. For instance, immunotherapy might be able to generate some tiny fraction of durable response irrespective of the volume of, of cancer. It might be the same for uh, microscopic disease as it is in the advanced setting. I don't know that there is such a fraction in this particular tumor type. I'm happy to say that there is such a fraction in metastatic melanoma. I'm happy to concede that. But for esophagus and GE junction cancer, I've not seen extended follow-ups uh, as to what happens to the, the long-term CRs, um, maybe with a caveat, which is I'm willing to believe it if the patient is MSI um, high. Uh, I, I think that there is some durability to those remissions. Um, why do I say all this? I just say all this to point out that IO fundamentally has a different properties in the adjuvant and metastatic space than cytotoxic drugs. It's a different class of agent, for Christ's sakes. Um, when it's a different class of agent, extrapolation of a surrogate validation coefficient to a different class of agents 
frankly, in my opinion, just should not be done. Um, I'm not even sure how robust the finding is for cytotoxic drugs. I, I didn't look too closely at it, but I can't imagine they have um, many, many randomized control trials for which they could perform trial level validation. Gosh, I should have looked into it. Um, I will look into it at some point, but I'm scared of what I'm going to find. But I'm certain that they ought not use that data to extrapolate to nivolumab in this setting. So I believe that the right answer here was that overall survival must have been the primary endpoint of the study. The second thing I'd say before I get into the study anymore, I will make the point that this is really a study of early nivolumab to eventual nivolumab. The patients on the control arm should have had a path to nivolumab because we've had randomized control trial data um, that nivolumab and it has a drug approval um, in this tumor type uh, in the relapse refractory setting. So eventually they should be getting it. Um, they should be getting definitive chemo RT, uh, then probably chemotherapy for metastatic relapse, and then probably nivolumab um, uh, at, when the time comes. And the question is, by giving it to many people early, is there a survival advantage over giving it to the people who happen to get there in the second or third line of therapy? Um, slightly different, of course, for GE junction than esophagus cancer based on approvals, and slightly different for Nevo and Pembro based on PDL1 cutoffs. But that's the question. It's a philosophical question. Does everyone need this nivolumab? And the only way to adjudicate that is to test it against the control arm of the best available US standard of care where they get nivolumab on the back end. Okay. I saw the overall, I saw the DFS curve. Can you see it? Uh, kind of. And here's what it says. It says the median DFS is 22 versus 11 months. Well, that sounds quite good. But of course, it's a bit of an artifact because that's like a doubling of uh, uh, of DFS. The hazard ratio is a close is a 0.69. It's 0.7. It's no doubling. And the reason is, of course, the curves kind of hug. It, they hug uh, that line that'll come right at the median. Very similarly to the mitostorin study. I think people may remember in mitostorin, the median was improved from I forget something like 20 months to 80 months. Uh, but of course, the drug has a certain fractional benefit, um, and the medians just happen to be one right above 50 percent, one right below 50 percent to get this huge artifactual uh, difference in medians. Um, and that's, of course, in disease-free survival. Um, they have the breakdown by histology. Um, uh, what's my point? My point is, um, fine, you have a DFS benefit. Um, am I convinced yet that you are increasing the curative fraction? Um, no, I'm not convinced yet. Um, I'm not convinced because I uh, don't have many people at risk um, in these Kaplan-Meier figures uh, beyond 30 months. I have a rule of thumb that if less than 10% of people are at risk, I, I don't consider that a real tale. I start to wonder if it is a fairy tale, if it might not be real. So I want to see more people at risk. That will happen with time. So I can really get a sense of, is there an increase in curative fraction? Um, the control arm, of course, uh, has to, of course, be getting, I think, checkpoint inhibitors when appropriate. And I, I have my doubts. The next thing I looked at was, okay, so, you know, you change your endpoint. I'm not happy about that. Um, did you at least provide the control arm you know, appropriate standard of care therapy when they relapse. And here's what I find. Let me grab this piece of paper. Boom. I got it right here. Table, table. What is it? S3, supplementary appendix. Boom. Patients with subsequent therapies. 40% of them got subsequent therapies on placebo. Why is it not higher? I don't know, but maybe maybe there is some problems going on here. 30% uh, of people with nivolumab got subsequent therapy. 16% um, got radiotherapy. What is this? 40, maybe a third of the people who got subsequent therapy on the placebo arm who got subsequent therapy are getting radiotherapy. That's not an acceptable subsequent therapy. You've performed neoadjuvant chemo RT. You've performed a surgery. Even if they're having local regional relapse, that is metastatic disease and should be treated with chemotherapy. Um, radiotherapy is not the right answer for those patients. 8% um, of them got repeat surgery. Again, I would disagree that that is the right answer. 34% of them got systemic therapy, of which only 19 was immunotherapy. 11% uh, was a targeted therapy. Um, wh what, what are you giving these people, targeted therapy? Uh, and other systemic anti-cancer therapy or chemotherapy. I mean, I think you'd be thinking of something like Folfox or something like that for these patients. The other piece of paper I pulled out of these lengthy appendix was the fact that as we see in other upper GI malignancies, there does appear to be some impact of the pd one CPS score and the hazard ratio. I don't see an interaction coefficient, but you know, over five, you're talking about a hazard ratio of 0.62. Again, this is for DFS, not OS. And less than five, you're talking about a hazard ratio of 0.9 uh, with a wide confidence interval. Um, but the the hazard ratio, but the the confidence intervals uh, and the point estimates do look a little bit different to me. Of course, you know, 
you don't want to make too much of something. You don't want to say that a subgroup doesn't work just because there's a wide confidence interval. Here we're talking about both the point estimate and the confidence interval. We're talking about biological plausibility. We're talking about multiple other studies in upper GI cancers that all come at the same thing, that it's very likely the case that there is a pdl one score below which this drug is simply uh, not doing much for uh, not many people. Um, my overall point with this study. I mean, this is a study that's going to uh, drum up a lot of business. It's going to earn uh, BMS uh, a bit more money. Uh, I guess BMS, uh, even though they were the first kid on the block with the uh, pdl one antibodies, they definitely uh, got schooled by Merck. Uh, Merck has dominated them in the market share. So if you were an industry analyst, you'd say BMS needs all the help they can get. And this will be a little bit, a little bit of help to them. Um, however, I think if you're a patient with esophagus cancer and if you're a doctor who cares about patients with esophagus cancer, there are more questions than answers. I don't know if anyone is being cured by nivolumab if given in the adjuvant setting. I don't know that anyone is being cured in the adjuvant setting who wouldn't otherwise have been cured had they gotten it when appropriate in the metastatic setting um, because there may be some durable responders. I guess I don't know if anyone is having durable response here. I certainly don't know if DFS is a valid surrogate for OS for, for this tumor type and this class of agents. I have no clue. I certainly wish they had used OS as the primary endpoint of this study and not used this, um, I think, inappropriate surrogate endpoint as the primary endpoint of this study. Um, I am depressed with the post-protocol care that is being given in this study. I think it's deeply inadequate. It certainly doesn't meet US standards. When this study inevitably shows an OS benefit, which it will, it will surely show an OS benefit because the control arm is getting such dilapidated therapy when they progress. I have no doubt it will show an OS benefit, but I won't know that that means everyone ought to get nivolumab up in the beginning rather than in the relapse refractory setting in the esophagus setting or uh, perhaps in the third line in the GE junction setting. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know if nivolumab should be given to these patients. And that is just too much uncertainty for a drug that's so costly that has real side effects. Um, I certainly think that, you know, that it's going to be used widely. Uh, the editorial is, uh, you know, a pep talk for uh, the makers of the drug. Um, but I have my doubts about whether or not this is a really good study. I think it is not a good study. And it's emblematic of a class of studies that are all uh, troublesome, which are studies that take drugs um, that are approved in latter lines of therapy and try to capture the largest market share. And the easiest way to capture the largest market share in the front line is to go, sorry, is to go in the front line, is to use a surrogate endpoint that you have no idea if it actually represents living longer, living better. Um, it is to um, um, not provide your control arm good therapy when they progress so that eventually you will show the OS benefit and say, see, we're right all along. Um, it's pretty much this trial. Uh, this trial is that, uh, Chuckmate 577. Um, those are my thoughts. I think um, I think it's 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 not the right study for the U.S. A lot of people are going to get checkpoint inhibitors. It might not be doing much for many of those people. There might be some people who take it for years, and they would have just done fine not having taken anything at all um, because they uh, uh, they uh, there is a tail on this curve. Um, and I think that um, one should be very very strict if one is to use this. Um, to definitely only use in people who are path CR positive, to only use in people who get R0 resection, another requisite of this study, uh, and not to uh, use it beyond that. Um, but I think, I think these studies and these kinds of approvals are a problem. We um, are letting manufacturers get tremendous market share, and we have very little idea if um, our patients benefit as a result of that. So my thoughts, checkmate 577.